good a place as any to start. I'd like to um, I'd like to go to the origin origination issue. Mm. Um, because um, the idea <clears throat> the idea that it's veiled Mayavad or subtle Mayavad or kind of uh, covert covert Mayavad is I think is 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 a unique insight that you have. I don't know if other people are saying it. Um, I think other people are kind of making the point that well, it's not what Prabhupada said. But I think yours, your contribution is unique in the sense that you're saying what well, it's not just the, it's not just the, Prabhupada didn't say it, but also uh, Prabhupada's whole campaign was against Mayavad, and this is just the form of covert Mayavad. So maybe we could talk some more about that. Um, okay, here's the question. Some people feel, as far as the origination issue goes, um, um, okay, maybe we were in the spiritual world with Krishna, uh, maybe we weren't. What's the big deal? All right. The big deal is, first of all, what is our process? Our process is that we can have limited knowledge through pratyaksha. Limited. And then Anuman gives us indirect a little more. But through these pratyaksha and Anuman, we can't get absolute knowledge about what is the actual reality because the senses are limited to the unreality, to the relative, which is a type of reality but isn't really called reality. It's a set. So we have to accept higher authority who is realized. And then, after accepting, apply intelligence. And that's called philosophical search for the absolute truth. The contradictions that flow into the mind upon hearing, because you can't put it all together. It's a colossal jigsaw puzzle with millions of pieces. So you receive some knowledge, you put a little uh, part of the puzzle together, that's laudable. But in and of itself, that's just a little part. You need to put the whole puzzle together. And in trying to put the whole puzzle together, you're going to come up with many apparent contradictions in the process. Those apparent contradictions need to be confronted and they need to be resolved. And the process is to hear from authority and then to uh, get rid of the apparent contradictions through philosophical pursuit for the absolute truth, not mental speculation. Meaning that you don't change any of the siddhanta given. You don't change any of the knowledge given. But in order to understand how it fits into the whole puzzle and where it fits and how important it is, all the pieces are important, but just like when you put together a puzzle, some of the blue sky where the piece is just flat out blue sky versus where it's part of somebody's eye and, and eye, but they're more important than that for the uh, actual whole puzzle. But the sky, you need to get that too. So Prabhupada said in so many places that we were originally with Krishna in the spiritual world. We were all originally Krishna conscious entities. The issue is personalism and impersonalism. Prabhupada says, how can this impersonalism stand? So we need to get free from impersonalism. It's very tough to do because we're surrounded by so many impersonal energies, including conditioned souls. They're personal on the spiritual level, but that spirit soul is, for all practical purposes, dormant. So we're dealing with a colossal machine, a conditioned machine, which looks like it's a person who's a reality person, but really when you get right down to it, it's the modes of nature working as a machine in the lower modes with very little sattva. That's a machine. So we're surrounded by all these machines in the form of uh, non-moving life, moving life, and conditioned humans in this age being totally absorbed in the lower modes. So we're, we're surrounded by our physical body, which is impersonal, and our mind also is being besieged constantly by energies which appear to be impersonal, although they ultimately all have a personal source, but 
The point of the matter is how can this impersonalism stand? It can stand if you have an upasiddhanta which helps it stand. And the upasiddhanta that we were not originally with Krishna in a sambandha in a relationship in the spiritual sky will promote impersonalism because the goal then, how can you return to Krishna when you're not responsible for having come down here in the first place? Oh, Krishna created me, I accept. Fine, you accept. But Krishna created you as a conditioned soul and he put you into a suffering position. You you never had your active rasa with him. You never had an active relationship with him. And you're now in this very bad position, although compared to all the other living entities, they're in worse, but you're inhuman. But still, there's so much suffering and it's temporary and so much bewilderment. And how can anybody in that situation, if they cannot see how they misused their free will and came down to the material world having misused it, how can anybody <coughs> get free subtly, subconsciously even, from the resentment that why was this done to me? I'm not responsible for this because I never was in the spiritual world to misuse my free will there to be sent into this. I was created like this with an innate desire to return to something that I was never at. So where does this return come from? Where does this back to Godhead come from? This must just be some kind of encouragement. But it isn't the reality because I wasn't there. These kind of thoughts lead to impersonalism because you're not personally responsible then. Because you're not personally responsible then. So it seems like there's some impersonal laws that just make it, this is the way the jiva is. But it's heavier than that because the maya body philosophy will become more attractive. Perhaps since the Vaishnavs like to use this technique, which isn't ultimately true, that I come from the spiritual world having misused my free will there and then I've been sent into this, maybe there's some other teachings in there that aren't ultimately true. Maybe the whole thing is just an enticement to get me to do certain sadhanas and tapasyas so that I become free from the mind, etc. And then I can be told, you know, the whole time we were telling you that it's personal ultimately, really it's not true. All of me, it's impersonal. Hmm, I can buy it because you've already told me that the guru may use this trick where he tells you that you came from the spiritual sky, having misused your free will there, and you had a personal relationship with Krishna, but then ultimately when you get to a certain point, he'll tell you, that was just a technique because you come from a Christian background, and this is a technique a guru uses. It all can lead to the concept that ultimately I am Brahman. The pillar of devotional service is choice. Free will is the pivot of the whole process. And free will means that it has to be right from the gate. Not down here it's free will, I can choose to serve my guru or not. It must be right from the gate that free will is involved intrinsically in why we're here. Because if the Supreme Personality of God, as the Siddhanta teaches, has complete free will and the Jiva has small quantities of whatever he has in full, then we must have, from our eternal position, our constitutional eternal position, a minute amount of free will. And this free will is the pivot of bhakti because you always make advancement. No matter how things play out, you always make advancement when you use your free will to serve the Guru and his orders, which are non-different. And whenever you don't, no matter how good you rationalize, you don't make advancement. So free will is the whole pivot here in the bhakti process. In the other processes, there's a lot of emphasis on personal power, personal endeavor. In the bhakti process, it's all based on choice and service. Choice and service. The spider got credit and Hanuman got credit. 
the amount of work that they were doing was incomparable to each other. But in Lord Ramachandra's eyes, the serve added the save attitude, the service attitude was present in the spider. He got the credit. He knew. And Hanuman had the service attitude. He had a lot more power. And he knew. And he was acting according to the seva. The, the, the Vaishnava groups that kind of lean towards the, um, that we weren't, didn't have a, a personal relationship. That some of their arguments are, you know, I know you've heard them, but it's like, it's, um, um, uh, how could we be happy in the spiritual world if, if, if the possibility of falling down was there? I mean, how could that be, you know, perfection? First of all, the level of happiness is unlimited and can't be measured. It's so great, and there's so much happiness. But you can't be God. So God has more happiness. That's the way it is. The Supreme Personality of Godhead has more power. He has more happiness eternally. He's always the superior and we're always the servant subordinate. And that's the way it is. So you can't have all of his happiness. Hmm. You can't have all of his power. Hmm. That's a good point. So when you all of a sudden let your free will be misused. And remember, we're talking about something that's called a chintya. It's called a chintya for a reason. It's called a chinti because you can understand it in terms of siddhanta to a point, but you cannot directly understand it firsthand completely until liberated. Until liberated, where you. So, um, so about the uh, the other thing about the uh, origination issue is uh, those who um, uh, who tend to think that we came from Mahavishnu. What they'll say is, "Well, what's the you know? We're talking about a sadhana that takes you into the leela of Krishna. So how can that be impersonal or mayavad? How do you reach it?" If you are adopting an upasiddhanta, you're going to reach it. If the guru preaches one thing and you preach another, but say, what does it matter? I'm doing strict sadhana. Many mayavadis do strict sadhana. Not many, but some. Or tapasya. The fact is that if the spiritual master has said, you come from a relationship with Krishna in the spiritual world. And he has said it many times. If you're going to be preaching, you're going to be asked the question, why are we here? That, that's not going to be able to be avoided. Did I deserve this? Why did I come here? And if you answer, well, I've got a view that uh, you're inside of my ambition of and now you're in a conditioned state in samsara and with an opportunity to go to a place you've never been oh all right that's what it is then that's the answer but that's not what your guru if you're initiated by prophet said to you so how are you going to become pure in your sadhana if you're not doing the prachara right you may have the sadhacharya right you may have uh, you may have a good paka character profile and behavior may be pretty good and you may do the sadhana pretty strictly that's possible too but if your prachar is uh, flawed in such a severe way on such a major major point of the siddhanta what to speak of any point on the siddhanta but a major point of origination because it's a question that will invariably come up from your followers, disciples, people listening to you. It'll come up and they will ask, where was I originally? Am I really responsible for this? They may not say it like that, but that's what they're really asking. And your guru has said, here's the teaching. You are responsible. You did misuse your free will. And you have an eternal relationship. That's why we call our magazine Back to Godhead. 
because you're supposed to return there because that's where you originally were. That's your eternal home. Did it not cover the question? Yes. <clears throat> um, when we were talking on the phone the other day, you mentioned something about Shakti, difference between Shakti and... I thought it was interesting, but I, I didn't grab the whole thing. In other words, are they saying, are the um, neo Gaudi Mutt, are they saying actually we can go back into being a Shakti of, of uh, Radha and Krishna? What I said, I remember what that section was, what I said is the Shakti doesn't have free will. The Shakti Tattva can't misuse free will. Oh, right. They can't fall down. The Jiva Tattva has free will. They can fall down. Both are servitors, but in different ways. Shakti Tattva is considered higher, and that's bona fide to consider Shakti Tattva higher than Jiva Tattva. The Jiva so what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to understand is... Um, Like certain deviations make sense to me. That the, the uh, uh, make sense in the sense uh, in the sense that I can see how the the hunkar gets some gets something out of it. But if you but start splitting hairs, well, did we come from Mahavishnu or were we originally with Krishna? Both of which both of which are let's face it are chintya at at this point. Um, what it, what it, what is the benefit? How, how does one benefit, assuming that he's fairly serious about? It? Well, remember the process is to repeat what the guru says, and that is not splitting hairs. In other words, repeat what the guru says. What he gives you is called prachar. You're preaching, but you have to do it. You have what he says, and then you repeat it. When you don't understand, when there is an apparent contradiction, you resolve it. Then you repeat it. And when people ask you about it, because you've resolved it, you can help to unbewilder them by explaining the apparent contradiction, why it is apparent. And if you explain it in a very concise, clear manner, perhaps they will understand it and it no longer will be a contradiction for them. Splitting hairs is only relevant on minor things. But major siddhanta intrinsic to the to the whole teaching as well as the process because the process is empowered when a major siddhanta such as we came here due to misuse of free will is understood at a very deep level that will empower this the process also the bhakti sadhana the bhakti seva so uh, splitting hairs is not applicable to this controversial issue. Splitting hairs is applicable to, to something like, you're rising at 5 a.m. instead of 4 a.m. and you can't make any advancement. There's your splitting hairs. Something like that. So apart from the fact that you're um, misrepresenting the teachings of the Sampradaya and the Sampradaya Acharya, um, you're talking about Neo Gaudi Mutt. Neo Gaudi Mutt. Mm -hmm. I'm still trying to come back to wh why, wh what would be the, the gain from doing that? Um, the gain is the guru becomes the all in all then. Ah. Because, oh, you've reached back there. You've made it back. Oh, I never was there. But you got there. You can get me there because you're there and you worked your way up. So I have to now worship you like anything to work my way back up so that you can say, here's how you do it. Here's how you work your way back up. Whereas when we were originally with Krishna, you have, you worship the Guru, but you worship the Guru as being also a servant of Krishna who did not use his free will, that has to be the attitude. He may be a sadhana siddha or he may be a kripa siddha, but that attitude is the attitude to adopt when someone is siddha. But you have a confidence, a very deep confidence 
that is not present otherwise, because it's eternal. You have an eternal sambandha jnana, you were there. It just, the cloud needs to be removed, a big thing. But nevertheless, it's there. It's eternally there. It's not operative now because of the cloud. So you have a confidence then. The guru is helping you remove the ointment from the eyes, uh, the cataract from the eyes. But really what it comes down to is that the, the bogus guru who teaches this apasadanta of the wrong origination, he gets a tremendous amount of control over his chela. Hmm. Whereas the other guru still has control over his devoted uh, chela. But it is not an all-in-all -all type. In other words, we're ultimately equal in the spiritual sky because we. I've always been there. I'm there now. And you originally were there. So I know how glorious you are. Whereas the other one is that you have no glories. You were never there. No one ever was from this world, but I reached there. And you have no power to reach there unless I tell you the techniques. So how is that Mayabad? Well, in and of itself, it's not Mayabad. As I said earlier, when you're asking the question, it's a covert form of Mayabad. For this reason, I'll repeat it again, because apparently it, you didn't catch it. <laughs> it's a covert form of Mayabad because... If you're given a teaching in so many places, as Prabhupada gave a teaching in so many places of the origination, in so many places, as Prabhupada gave a teaching in so many places of the origination, and then a counter teaching comes in that says, no, ultimately it's not true, but it's good in the beginning. Remember, the Maya bodies say it's good to do bhakti yoga and the sa rupa sa form worship, but ultimately it's impersonal. Once you reach the stage where you realize the white light, then give up the deity worship because ultimately the thing is impersonal. But let us deceive you. It is to deceive the disciples. Let us deceive you in the beginning because then with that deception, you can get really energized on your deception. And then when you get to the mature stage, oh, by the way, what we were telling you there, it ain't so. So in the same way, the Maya bodies bring you to a point where you say, I am Brahman, I am God. I'm not Dasa. I'm not eternally Dasa. I'm not eternally a servant. Through sometimes praising some of them sometimes praise the process of bhakti as a preliminary stage. So there's a deception in that. So similarly, if you get the teachings from the Sampradaya Acharya, that you're originally in the spiritual world, with your rasa active, Sambandha was there. But then you're told by some other party, who may even have been initiated by the Sampradaya Acharya, and may be technically a quote-unquote older godbrother, that, you know, that nature teaching that he gave us, I've come to the realization it's not so. We ultimately were not in the spiritual sky with Krishna. It's not right. It's not what my cult that I'm into now teaches. Then it's the same process of that deception. Yeah. So then you can entertain in your mind, well, maybe then if that isn't so, maybe it's ultimately that I'm also God. And I'm being told I'm not God as a technique so that I can get fired up to do my sadhana. So it, it sets you up for, for developing that mentality of, as you say, of um, uh, revising the path as you go along. It, it lets you look at the Guru's teachings as potentially all deceptive. If he deceived on this, why not this also? Hmm. If he said 50 times in his teachings that you weren't in the spiritual, that you were in the spiritual sky, and one time he says something which needs Lakshana Vritti or Gauna Vritti understanding, 
not direct, where mukya vritti is not directly to be applied to it. But if you use mukya vritti to it, which you shouldn't, you could say that he's saying you weren't in the spirit of sky. The ratio is so lopsided. And if explanations are given very clearly that that's Lakshana Vritti, that's Gauna Vritti, here's why he's saying it. When he says, this is an unprecedented event that Jaya and Vijaya were sent out of the spiritual sky because ultimately no one form, falls from the spiritual world. You say, there it is. Case closed. No. He's saying there you have to use Gauna Vritti, Lakshana Vritti. He's saying, no one who has not misused their independence falls. But they didn't misuse because they still have the service attitude. They made a mistake with the Kumars, but it was in service attitude they are guarding the gate. They didn't give up their service. They didn't give up their service attitude. And they were sent down. You're not supposed to be sent down for that. You're supposed to be sent down when you misuse your free will. That's what's being talked about in the sentence. Hmm. Still not convinced? I know. That's all really good stuff. Um, I'd just like to explore more because I think yeah, I, 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 I think that um, because in one of your articles, recent ones, you were talking about how Prabhupada was launch full scale revolution. Not just against uh, modern Hindu, uh, Hinduism, but against, you know, kind of, he used quite grand words, you know, this was like a theological revolution because he was saying how we're, we were with Krishna and we have a direct relationship with Krishna, it just has to be revived and that, that's quite um, revolutionary. Actually, revolutionary is a good word because revolution means you revolve revolution to the to an original point so revolution means there was a good point and we need to have a revolution back to the good point mm -hmm. that's also what i'm saying in regard to devotees need to have a revolution and go back to square one i'm also preaching that why am i saying is am i being a fanatic on that no i'm not saying close down the temples sell all the vehicles wrap up the deities and drop them into a river, I'm not saying any such thing. That's not square one. Square one means to go back to square one before all the wrong octaves started taking place. Mm. All the deviant octaves, which now are devolutionary octaves, going in the opposite direction. For a while they were ascending, but they were deviant, meaning that they weren't going the straight arrow, they had deviated to something else, but now they're not even that. They're descending octaves. But I'm saying, stop all that. Get back to square one. Where did we go off the rails? And we have to go back to that. That's called a revolution, to go back to that. So how is that revolutionary? How is it revolutionary for Prabhupada to say, we, we were with Krishna in the spiritual sky. We've... Fallen into the material world because of our misuse of independence. Now we need to revive that relationship and go back home, back to Godhead. It's a revolution to the original teachings of Bhakti Manod Thakur, who of course Sampradaya Acharya, then through the whole parampara of Bhakti Manod Thakur. And Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati's teachings were that too, but he, he didn't make it as explicit because he really was dealing with the Mayavadis. Of course, Bhakti Manod Thakur also was dealing with the Mayavadis. Now, what happened after Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Goswami was no longer with us, that is different from the real thing. So we need to get a revolution back, and that's what Prabhupada did. He rejected this, and he, he went back and revolved back to the real teachings, which were completely against this thing that had become encrusted after Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Goswami left. Mm -hmm. So it's a revolution back to the parampara, the real teachings. That's why Prabhupada doesn't include anybody. Gorakshore Das Babaji, of course, but Bhakti Manavata Kaur, 
And then because it's a Diksha line there, Gorak Vashur Das Babaji and then Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami, having the Parampara work like that, and then Prabhupada, there's nobody in between there. And he's going back and saying, here's what these teachings were, and then, but in the interim, there's been another thing in regard to this Siddhanta. But I'm not buying it, I'm not giving it, I'm telling you what the actual Siddhanta is, it's a revolution back to the Siddhanta. So all this one that has been a deviation from much further, much uh, longer ago than when Prabhupada came, they're all, their disciples are all saying, this is not the teaching, this is a concoction. No, it is the teaching, it's a revolution back to the real thing.